welcome to The Authority File, the academic library podcast from Choice, brought to you this week by Roman and Littlefield. I'm Bill Mickey, the host of the podcast and the editorial director at Choice. This week, I continue my conversation with Janet Hunju Clark, Raymond Pun, and Moni Tong about their book, Asian American Librarianship and Library Services. We discuss the oppositional nature of Asian American studies as a discipline, and Mooney explains what a talk story program is and how libraries can implement similar programs to better engage with their communities. Okay, so in uh, in Chapter 14, um, Information as Praxis, uh, Todd Homna um, calls Asian American studies a, uh, a, a quote-unquote oppositional field um, by which he means, um, I think, that um, it's a field that doesn't really fit into tra- the traditional disciplines like history or English or biology or whatever. It's interdisciplinary. Um, because of its interdisciplinarity, uh, resources are often completely missing or scattered across a number of different categories, making them hard to find. Um So that seems like a problem for students and others doing research, but even more so um, perhaps for librarians um, as information professionals, uh, as organizers. um, How have you or how has your library um, worked to address the inequities inherent um, in these existing classification systems? Um, And Janet, I'll just throw that one to you to start. Yes. Um, this was a, a great essay, um, an example of, um, of, of the kinds of creative, um, innovative work that um, people are doing. Um, I think it, uh, what it tells us is that we have to be creative and expansive about how to find materials for students and researchers and, you know, think about um, where the resources might be hidden in communities because they have not been studied or structurally institutionalized or otherwise recognized as traditional um, disciplinary um, components. So um, it seems, you know, it's it's an oppositional field of study because of its, uh, because its very existence is a critique of the Western academic institution. So, mm-hmm. you know, um, and so those those are great points of entry. Um, but it means that we have to um, look at and uh, work with that interdisciplinarity, and we have to work with sociologists and public policy folks and literature and film folks to include and stretch beyond those beyond their traditional uh, disciplinary boundaries. So uh, it's kind of like a scavenger hunt in some ways, but it's also, there's an advocacy role as well because we have to, you know, approach these traditional disciplines and say, well, have you looked at it from the Asian American perspective and what are the issues that are pertinent to Asian American literature? Mm -hmm. Um, So, uh, from the back end, from the li- library end, we have to be vigilant about uh, biases and omissions in classification systems. Yeah. Um, yep, and to critique and work with our catalogers to educate and expand their understanding of concepts, principles, or ideas that are pertinent to Asian American studies um, and other existing modes of inquiry. Um, uh, and and also uh, actively validate non-traditional or unacademic hmm. sources of knowledge, like materials or sources that are uh, primary sources that might be, you know, quote unquote, hidden in communities. Mm-hmm. Uh, and we have to, you know, it's an active work of unpacking the assumptions that go into what counts as legitimate. Um, in a, in a lot of ways, so it's really trying to push those boundaries. Um, those of us, I have a background in Asian American studies, so um, it, you know some of the some of um, my work is to help um, expand people's understanding of uh, you know of what Asian American studies is. There's you know been um, there's a there's um, uh, a tendency to conflate Asian and Asian American studies, for example, that's easily done. And, uh, you know, um, it's it takes work to um, uh, let people know what the differences are, what the convergences are, but also what the differences are. And that helps 
us um, create better classification systems, better access points, um, a better programming, mm-hmm. so that it actually speaks to um, the the differences and the similarities um, in between Asian and Asian American studies, but also among the different ethnic studies and American studies, et cetera. Right. Well, well, well go ahead, Ray. I'm sorry. Oh, sorry. I was just going to chime in. I uh, totally agree with what Janet's saying and uh, wanted to highlight one of the chapters, too, because um, we have uh, Tiu Wei Lu, who is a colleague of mine specializing in institution repository, and she actually conceptualizes how working with the institution repository or a digital one where you can work with faculty across the disciplines to create a journal or some sort of a a scholarly work that supports communities or that investigates the issues that are going on in the communities, particularly for Asian American. And I think it's a thoughtful piece to help thinking about how to go about this process and connecting to what Janet's saying, that there are hidden data, hidden resources in the community that is Mm. often overlooked. And this kind of work can really be shined through the efforts of librarians collaborating with faculty. Our guests this week, Janet Hunju Clark, Raymond Pun, and Moni Tong, appear courtesy of Roman and Littlefield. For more perspective on the professional journeys of Asian American and Pacific Islander librarians, check out their edited volume, Asian American Librarians and Library Services. It's full of interviews with Asian American library leaders like Dr. Sarah Park Dolan, Samip Malik, Vang Vang, and many more. It also includes insightful essays from Adrian Lim and Todd Hanma, as well as others, on topics such as building collaboration between campuses and communities, and strategies for increasing the diversity of the library workforce. When you order from Roman.com, that's R-O-W-M-A-N, use the promo code CHOICEPOD17 to save 30% off the cover price. I'm wondering if we can just, can we talk a little bit about the, the LC subject headings? <laughs> um, talk, tell, describe what's going on there for our listeners, um, you know, and put this sort of in the context of the, the broader issue here. I mean, um, you know the the idea that um, you know these these the biased or even pejorative sort of subject headings that uh, that are still in existence. All right, that's uh, a very um, important uh, important issue in um, Asian American librarianship, but also uh, you know in perhaps in uh, other kinds of ways too, like women's studies or, you know, um, other ethnic studies. And I'll just give you, start with an example of um, Chang Rae Lee's book, Native Speaker, which, uh, you know, was um, widely well-received. When you look at the the subject headings, Library of Congress subject headings for that book, one of them, there's about three of them, um, and one of them is Aliens, United States Fiction that's assigned to it. And mm. this book is not about extraterrestrials. If you, <laughs> if you know this book, it's a wonderful book. It's not about, you know, aliens from outer space, but it is but it shows a legacy term um, reflecting the dehumanizing terms that were used to refer to people of color legally and culturally for hundreds of years. Um, Someone who's looking for Asian American literature or Asian American authors would not find this author or title as as currently cataloged by the Library of Congress and any library who simply copy cataloged it. Um, One of our chapters... um, uh, is by Arlene Yu, and she talks about this issue in the field of dance and performance. Um, until Asian American dance became a Library of Congress subject heading in 2016, which is just last year, yeah. there was no easy way to discover works that covered that topic. So how were they how were they covered? Well, they were just basically subsumed under the larger, the broader heading dance, or American dance. So these are ways that Asian American experiences, histories, um, and resources are marginalized, unrecognized, or structurally hidden. And uh, that you know, it. Sanford Berman is the the king of um, of this discussion. Many years ago, uh, when he talked about um, 
prejudicial uh, terms um, uh, that uh, reflect the biases, cultural biases in in the Library of Subject uh, Library of Congress subject headings, and you know there's still so much work to be done. Um, uh, as you can see, if if we can't find Asian American dance, or if we can't find a, a category called, um, I'm sorry, find Chang Rei Lee's book under uh, um, Asian American literature, then you know uh, somebody who doesn't know who's trying to discover something about Asian American dance or Asian American literature is uh, is going to only get some of the information, you know, some of the perhaps more recently cataloged things, but um, there's going to be a large uh, part of uh, um, the materials that are going to be undiscovered, that are going to stay undiscovered. What what goes into um, making a change at, at that level with the, with the um, LC subject headings? What What needs to happen there? So um, I'm I'm just gonna be very broad here because I'm not a cataloger, but I have seen some of the discussion about how um, what it takes to change um, subject uh, headings, and because it's the Library of Congress, it actually has to go through uh, a congressional vote or something. Mm. So in other words, it's very it's very involved. Uh, there's a comment period. I mean, somebody has to make a suggestion, then the, it gets published and, uh, for a comment period. And then, you know, there's actually a congressional vote. And even last year, the terms um, um, illegal aliens, um, r- resident aliens, the, these terms are still, still very much in use. And there was an effort um, 2015 and 16, I believe, to um, to update those, to you know, to correct that, and um, it it did not pass. It did not. Uh, it was not successful, uh, which is really um, telling. I mean, it's yeah. it's a commentary about what uh, how um, how uh, entrenched certain uh, prejudices and biases are. Mm-hmm. Right, which makes your your book all the more important here. Um, so there, a chapter by um, um, Lessa Kanani Opua Paleo Lozada, um, where there's this idea of uh, um, of what's called a talk story. Um, and for those who don't know, um, uh, Moni, I think you can answer this one. But I'm wondering if you could fill in our listeners on what exactly a talk story is. Yeah. So talk story. Um is a Hawaiian expression. The phrase itself, talk story, is a Hawaiian expression. It means to chat informally. And this is a partnership between APALA, the Asian Pacific American Librarians Association, and AILA, the American Indian Librarians Association, um, to provide grant money, book lists, and other resources so that libraries and other educational institutions can have cultural programming that promotes Asian Pacific American uh, heritage and culture and American Indian culture and heritage. Um, So you'll definitely want to check them out. They're online at talkstorytogether.org. There are these great book lists that they put together that I frequently reference and look to when I need to find... um, an authentic APA or American Indian uh, book. Um, And I believe Ray even received one of the talk story grants, which they do annually. Yeah, that's right. And this was last November, last year, and uh, received the grant to bring in two storytellers from um, the Native American community in Fresno. And this was a public program in collaboration with our cross-cultural and gender center. And we invited them to really uh, share children's stories, their own oral histories. Um, And it was just a really great event where um, people brought in their children and they were able to hear the um, different experiences that they were going through. But uh, that grant really uh, helped 
um, promote us to engage with the community at large. So, Ray, would that be a good way, obviously, to get a program like this started? I mean, you know, what advice, I guess, would you give to um, other librarians to, you know, to if they're interested in um, having this in their own libraries, how they might be able to get a program going? Yeah, they should definitely look into the um, grant process at uh, and the website that Moni suggested mm -hmm. and also think about their um, local experts, people who are in the community who could really come to the library and share their experiences, share their knowledge. And this is a good way to really um, start having these conversations and then build off of that and doing exhibits and so forth. But uh, definitely uh, look into cultural experiences for the community. Okay. I'll just add one uh, quick thing here. Um, I think there are a couple other um, examples of talk story um, grants in the book and those, and I, you know, um, I'm not, I haven't uh, been directly involved with any of them, but so when I read them, I just thought these, these, um, librarians or whoever, you know, um, um, applied for these grants really were very, um, resourceful. They looked for partnerships and other, uh, others in the community who, um, had a passion and commitment to make these events happen and and um, make it a community engagement event. And some of these projects, I mean, it's great that the grant is there, um, but I, uh, I saw that some of these projects um, were really very low budget. It was really mostly fueled by their passion and their vision, and uh, I really admired that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just to piggyback on what Janet was saying, uh, one of the chapters is by Dora Ho from the Chinese American Librarians Association. They have a right, project that's called the, Yeah, that's the one I was Fa thinking of. Yeah, Family Family Literacy First, um, and that one is for Chinese culture and and heritage. Um, but like Ray was saying before, and and Janet as well, uh, these grants definitely help, but uh, they also it doesn't mean if you don't get the grant, you can't do cultural programming at your library. Um, I think as long as you have allies and uh, community partners and you reach out to, um, to the community, that you can really put something together on a very low budget or no budget at all. You just heard from Janet Hunju Clark, Raymond Pun, and Moni Tong. This concludes episode two of our four-part series. This episode was brought to you by Roman and Littlefield and Choice. Be sure to join us for the next episode where we talk about diversity in higher education. I want to point out that it's not just the people of color or, you know, Asian Americans who are in these positions who are responsible for making these changes happen. They are part, they are members of the structure and the institution, but really the institution itself is what needs to recognize that need, the need and the rewards of diversity in librarianship, but also obviously in other, other professions and of course throughout higher education. You can search for and listen to all of the episodes of the Authority File podcast on iTunes, Google Play, or Stitcher. You can also find the podcast on our website. Just click on the librarianship dropdown. If you like what you hear, please take a moment to give us a review on your favorite podcast app. That's all for this week. Thanks for joining us. Thank you.